So we have uh, enough uh, social distancing now. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really very delighted to see you in person because it is, I think, the first time I have uh, offline uh, event this semester uh, from January this year until today. I had only online courses and online discussion with uh, students and uh, uh, there are a few reasons why I have, uh, I wanted to have this uh, event as an offline event. Uh, first one is I wanted to see you in person. And secondly, I wanted to introduce uh, two most uh, prestigious and famous experts on the European Union uh, to you um, today. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, going to be a very interesting, and I hope uh, this is going to be a very interesting and very fruitful event for you. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, in introduce uh, two panelists. On my right, uh, there is uh, Dr. Michael Reiter, uh, His Excellency, and he's uh, the uh, EU ambassador to the uh, ROK, Republic of Korea. And he has been serving uh, around to four years now. And uh, it is one of the reasons why I invited him uh, to this offline uh, event because he is soon leaving Korea. So this is one of the last uh, events he's participating. And uh, um, it is really very pre prestigious for Korea University to have him uh, in his uh, last uh, months of his stay in Korea. And on my left, I have uh, Dr. Kim Hong Jong, uh, president of uh, KIEP, Korea Institute for International Economic Policy. Um, as you know, the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy is uh, the government think tank. And uh, he was uh, uh, more than 20 years now uh, working for KIEP. Uh, dealing with uh, international trade issues and also focusing on uh, EU affairs. And he is uh, one of a few uh, internationally prominent uh, EU uh, studies scholars in Korea. Uh, we have been um, cooperating in many events together with uh, um, Dr. Reiter. So I hope uh, this is uh, going to be very interesting and uh, productive uh, discussion for you. Uh, I have uh, selected the uh, topic like the future of the EU, uh, but probably I'd like to revise it a little bit, uh, adding uh, the future of the EU and Korea-EU relations, because Ambassador Reiter has uh, uh, written quite recently, uh, two weeks ago uh, or so, a uh, article about the 10th anniversary of uh, Korea EU strategic partnership. As you see here uh, in this booklet, uh, this uh, article is included, right? And uh, Dr. Kim uh, was uh, writing a uh, report about uh, EU uh, European Parliament election of last year and its implication uh, for the future of Europe as well. And uh, the last paper you uh, see here is uh, my paper uh, I wrote uh, in the um, Oxford uh, Research Encyclopedia on Politics about the European Union. So uh, you will see here uh, that uh, we were focusing on Korea-EU relations as well as the future of the European Union. So it is quite uh, opportune that uh, we change the uh, title of this uh, discussion to the future of the EU and Korea-EU relations. Without further ado, I'd like to dis uh, start uh, the uh, discussion. Um, when we talk about uh, the future of EU, EU and the future of uh, Korea-EU relations, I think it is quite necessary to uh, have some evaluation about the uh, achievements of the European Union so far, uh, so that 
uh, we uh, would like to first start uh, having discussion on the main achievements of the European Union. Uh, so, um, the first word is uh, yours, Michael, Michael. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to come back, and I do that quite regularly. Um, and uh, yes, as, as, as uh, Song Hoon said, uh, I, I will leave by the end of October. I will send the ambassador into retirement, and I will try to activate the professor, which might then be a good occasion to come back in a year's time, perhaps, and, 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 and see where we have uh, developed. Um, when I think about the European Union first, and we will talk about EU Korea later, um, I think it's still important to underline that the European Union started as a peace project. And the peace project, I think, is of particular relevance when you talk on the Korean Peninsula, where you are technically in the state of war because you only have an armistice and not a peace treaty. And if you look back into the history of, the, of Europe, then you will see that in the 19th and first half of the 20th century, Europe was always part of the problem and not of the solution two world, war, world wars and the Holocaust was not something to be proud of. Millions of people died, not only in Europe, but worldwide. And therefore, politicians got together and said, well, enough is enough. But they were haunted also by their experience that after the first world war, they had already said enough is enough. Now, in order to make sure that enough is enough, in reality, it was the Jean Monnet and Robert Schumann who came up with a relatively simple idea in thinking what do you need in order to make war. And at the time, we are talking at the beginning of the 50s, it was primarily steel and energy to produce steel or to form steel into weapons. And the prominent form of steel of energy in the 1950s was coal. And therefore, the very simple idea was if we control together coal and steel, then nobody can start rearming and prepare for war again. And that was implemented. And out of this simple concept, developed the European Union with its institutions, with the treaties, with the rule of law, and created a single market, the biggest single market in the world. So this element of peace, rule of law, respect for values, translates into the European Union's conviction that multilateralism in, the, in international relations is, has to be the main building element of an international system. That applies politically, and therefore the European Union promotes and supports the United Nations. That translates into trade relations, Therefore, the European Union has always been a champion of the World Trade Organization and the rule-based uh, trading system. And it has also made clear that a certain power, and if you are the largest economy in the world, if you are the largest trading power in the world, if you are the largest donor of development aid in the world, if you are the largest contributor to the United Nations, then that gives you responsibility. Responsibility not only in economic terms, but also in terms of engagement in world politics. 
And to that end, we want and we need partners. And there I'm making the bridge to Korea. We have selected worldwide only 10 countries to be strategic partners of the European Union. We have four in Asia. It's India, China, Korea, and Japan. So there we want the support of Korea as a strategic partner, not only in the bilateral relationship, but also in the global relationship. I think from the achievements, I would also like to put up, in addition to the firsts which I have mentioned, the very strong engagement of the European Union, which is, by the way, supported wholeheartedly by most of European citizens, the engagement for fighting climate change, which was recently translated in the European Green Deal. And I was very happy when, when suddenly, in the last election here, the Green Deal was smuggled into the program of the Democratic Party. President Moon Jae-in was talking about the um, new Korean deal. And I hope that the green, which is introduced there after a little bit of uh, uh, massaging, mm -hmm. is not only paint, but is real green. But I think that's something we can uh, discuss them. So in sum, I think these are achievements of the, of the European Union on a worldwide scale, also globally, and of course also internally in, in that we are trying to, uh, to maintain democratic system and values. Having said that, I'm perfectly aware that we also have problems. We have internal problems and we have also problems to project the political role of the European Union. So I don't have rosy glasses, but at a, in a first go, I wanted to uh, show you where, where, where are the, the strong points. The weak points come always automatically. Thank you. Uh, President Kim, what is your observation about the uh, achievements of the European Union? Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, thank you for students uh, for sharing time with me. Uh, I'm very happy to have to have you like the uh, in person, and then after long uh, times of the the social distancing, right? Uh, I fully agree with the uh, the uh, micro right uh, micro about the, uh, the achievement of the European integration, such as the uh, value and also uh, and then the other impact, actually positive impact to the, the other countries, including Korea. Uh, first of all, let me remind you that uh, this European integration uh, initiative is uh, something like the uh, uh, peace process, um, as the Michael uh, told, emphasized. And then, the, because of the uh, some uh, problems in the uh, the, the political in the, uh, integration, then uh, you will know that um, the, the more focusing on the economic integration was uh, strengthened. But every stage is in the uh, the economic uh, integration. Uh, in every steps, uh, political process and political decision, decision making uh, was the uh, the most influential to achieve the uh, economic integration. So uh, this is one part uh, the, of the economic integration is something like uh, uh, autonomous economic power is an integration, but uh, we cannot uh, forget that um, this all this kind of economic integration. Uh, was initiated by the uh, political uh, initiatives. So uh, that's what I want to emphasize. The second issue is something about the value. Uh, uh, through the uh, European integration, uh, Europe just uh, tried to solve the, uh, the some many uh, problems which uh, you observed the, uh, in 19th centuries and 17th centuries. Uh, Michael just said something like a problem. And then so rule of law, yeah, and then human rights and other uh, issues uh, emphasize the, the, uh, through the European integration. And the European people uh, try to achieve the, all of these kind of values uh, in daily life uh, through the European integration. I think that is very important. And second thing that um, the about value problem, values thing is that something like uh, uh, some 
uh, other new issues like uh, uh, GSP, uh, gen generalized system of preference, this kind of idea uh, for the uh, developing countries, uh, preferable uh, market access was provided to the developing countries uh, to the European market, advanced market, uh, which is the, uh, the new ideas from uh, newly, uh, first uh, initi initiated by the European uh, uh, countries and the European Union. And also the environmental standard and the climate change, uh, combating climate change, all of these kind of uh, uh, new emerging issues uh, was created by the Europe and the EU. I think that is very important things, and that's why the uh, Koreans also uh, do not uh, cease the, the, to looking at the, what the, the EU uh, is now doing. And the last one, I want, I want to talk about the uh, economic one uh, as an economist. Uh, the European integration uh, create, of course, I mean, the, the, you know, enhancing uh, competition. The first one is competition. That is very important thing. Uh, you know, the member countries, uh, when uh, they uh, just I mean, keep uh, strengthening the, the competition uh, and they just want to uh, create the, the borderless uh, or big market and all the city, uh, many citizens and the industries and uh, companies and the associations worrying about the, the enhancing competition and the losing jobs and the other uh, things uh, which might be created uh, from the enhancing competition uh, by lifting uh, border. Uh, what I mean border means that um, between the, the France and the, you know Germany and France and Italy, you know, Italia and the other uh, member countries. But uh, this kind of very impressive competition policy uh, enhancing the efficiency uh, in uh, domestic uh, single market and also uh, had a very impressive uh, uh, cooperation with the other com competition policies, uh, authorities uh, of other countries, including uh, Korean uh, one as well. And also, uh, as for the economic achievement of the European integration, uh, some people uh, might argue that um, European integration was uh, more or less the uh, the 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 best the most beneficiaries of the European integration is uh, uh, German German ones. But um, uh, you 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 should not forget that the other uh, less developed countries and also uh, also uh, largely benefit by the, uh, the European integration. Think of the uh, the case of Spain and Portugal and Greece in 1970s, 60s and 70s. Uh, all these three countries were kind of dictatorship countries. And then af after the uh, European integration, after the joining the, the EU, uh, then nobody would doubt that um, this Spain is uh, still a demo uh, demo uh, dictatorship country. It's uh, fully uh, integrated into the, uh, the European value and also democratic countries now you can observe. But, uh, thing was very uh, different uh, uh, when it comes to the, uh, the the situations in 1970s and 60s. So all of this kind of very rapid uh, democratization and then also political democratization and economic uh, development uh, uh, was achieved by the, uh, this European integration. I, I want to uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. I mean, uh, I fully agree that. Uh, the uh, European integration, the start of the European integration was a uh, peace project, but uh, economic co-prosperity was another uh, very big uh, target of uh, this uh, adventure of the European Union member states. And uh, if you take a look at the European Union at the moment, uh, today's EU is uh, the largest trading bloc, as mentioned by Ambassador and also the largest donor of the ODA funds worldwide. Uh, some 54% of all worldwide F uh, ODA funds is coming from uh, the European Union, either EU or EU member states. Um, also, the mentioned by Dr. Kim, uh, we have the European Union as a norm setter, not norm taker. It's, uh, initiatives of uh, uh, international norms are really very important and appreciated by the international society. So we have uh, lots of uh, positive sides of the European integration and we have achieved a lot. Um, however, if you take a look at the last past 20, 10 to 20 years, 
we have seen a few crises of the European Union, right? So uh, one is the most recent one is the COVID-19 crisis. Um, the uh, also refugee crisis uh, we have seen, and also eurozone debt crisis, as well as uh, Brexit uh, was also uh, kind of uh, burdening the European Union politics and economies. So uh, how uh, how do you see Ambassador or Dr. Kim now first? How do you see uh, the various diverse EU crises? and how uh, the European Union has uh, responded to it. Do we have some Asian or Korean perspective on that? If we are talking about that, this issue I mean, about uh, 10 years ago, maybe uh, much, much more optimistic yeah. Yeah, yeah. talks we, we, can, we can have. Uh, I mean, back to the uh, in, uh, 2007 or 2006, seven, that was just before the uh, global uh, financial crisis, then we uh, had a look at the, uh, the great success of uh, currency euro and also uh, common co-prosperity of the European Union uh, member countries. But uh, as Professor Park uh, uh, emphasized, uh, so, so many challenges now the, uh, against the, uh, the European integration movement, also European Union. And then uh, I think that these, all of these kind of challenges, uh, not only just I mean, covered by the European Union, but also the member countries as well. So the failures or crisis in the governance, you know, all, in tackling all of these kind of issues, uh, uh, not, we cannot say that, that this is the fault of the European integration. This is just I mean, governance of the, uh, the uh, nation states and the governance of the uh, supranational entities. Yeah? Uh, so uh, we cannot blame that uh, all of this kind of the, the crisis I mean, uh, because of the European integration. Uh, that is one point that I want to think. The second thing is that, um, uh, of course, um, because because of the, uh, the some uh, decision making systems, the problems of the, this kind of decision making uh, system uh, due to the, uh, the supranational entities and the member countries uh, relations, then uh, I see that um, some kind of uh, uh, delays and uh, some inefficiencies in the, the tackling the, these issues, such as the uh, refugee and then COVID. Uh, some people argue that um, COVID uh, uh, try to uh, relate the other uh, COVID uh, uh, issue with the, uh, some kind of regime, the efficiency of a regime or a superiority of regime, but I don't think so. I don't agree. Uh, I don't think that China has argued that um, because of the Chinese, Chinese system is superior that um, uh, China uh, easily uh, recovered the, from the, this disease. I don't agree that um, uh, the uh, Korean regime, the Korean political regime is uh, much more superior than the Korea is, has a uh, less problem uh, against the COVID. So the tackling about the, the disease and the COVID is uh, uh, not, kind of, not that kind of the relations to the, the regime or political uh, system, uh, but just I mean this is uh, uh, leadership and then how to uh, how much uh, the policymakers I mean understand uh, this kind of disease and the pandemic something like that. So uh, just focusing on the the disease and then uh, that is a very important thing. I just wanted to point out just one thing about the Brexit yeah. uh, because the. Uh, I talked a lot of things about the Brexit uh, to the Korean society, so I think that I have responsibility to talk to talk about mm -hmm. these issues. Uh, well, Brexit. I mean, um, first one. Uh, my, observa uh, my observation. My observation is that um, there would be no more uh, exit from the European Union uh, member states uh, because the, uh, the after the Brexit, uh, many many member countries now. Uh, understand that um, you know, after the exit, uh, maybe their nation states, their identity uh, could could disappear. Uh, now, the after the Brexit, uh, maybe you know, in the near future, uh, at least I mean, one one thing about the United Kingdom is that um, uh, how far, how much uh, they can just preserve the the United uh, region. Maybe Scotland and the Northern Ireland uh, may have may have a different uh, way of thinking. Uh, how to uh, tackle uh, this uh, Brexit with the, their uh, establishing their, their new nation states. So uh, countries like the, uh, the, the Spain 
and then you know Romania and there other countries also have similar problems in in domestic politics. So uh, I don't think that, uh, that kind of things uh, uh, can uh, uh, happen again. Uh, and then uh, so after the Brexit, I think that the European Union, uh, that uh, the remaining member countries, uh, try to uh, strengthen the the, the integrate level of the integration uh, much more, and then to uh, further uh, integration movement uh, uh, could be uh, uh, strengthened, uh, but not all of the other uh, comprehensive issues, but uh, some several issues, and they want to do, they try to deepen uh, the, in the level of integration. Uh, that's my observation. Thank you, Michael. You have well the the as we cannot avoid Brexit. Let let me say a few words about Brexit. <laughs> the um, well, I completely uh, agree with, with with President Kim. Um, I think the the effect on the other countries is that was not the best idea our British friends ever had. Um, just uh, I think last week a, um, a study was published which claims that uh, the UK will lose as much money as they have received from the European Union in the last uh, decades in a very short uh, uh, time. Um, you can also see rather unproductive uh, investment which is needed now in, in border, uh, building up borders, border control um, uh, points. Millions will be spent spend on that. And we have been active now in the last 70 years to get rid of borders and border controls. And um, I just had a, a look, the European Commission has just a, a few days ago published um, a, a paper which is called Getting Ready for Changes. It is called Communication on Readiness at the End of the Transition Period between the European Union and the United Kingdom. And uh, you can read it. It's it, it's quite it's quite readable if you if you're interested. About thirty pages, and it has an annex of about fifty um, uh, sector-specific measures, where it is pointed out what will be the problems from next year onwards. Um, just to give you one one example, the European Union has concluded over the last years Open Skies Agreement, and Open Skies Agreement means that um, European airlines can fly, if there is such an agreement, to any point in another country. And we have concluded that also now with, with Korea. So you don't have to negotiate bilaterally, you just get a slot and you can, can fly. From the 1st of January next year, British Airways is a British carrier and no longer an EU carrier, which means they have to go through this cumbersome procedure to negotiate with each and every country in the world landing rights for British Airways. In the European Union, you have it automatically. They have to build up an agricultural policy. The last 40 years, agricultural policy was designed in Brussels, implemented in the UK. They have to build up a competition policy, competition law, which was handled by Brussels. Now they have to, to, to do it. They have to build up a task force which knows how to negotiate free trade agreements. Free trade uh, uh, agreements over the last 45 years have been concluded by the European Commission. It was rather I, I, uh, ironic, I must say, that because there are no British op officials who know how to negotiate free trade agreements. So the, in the first go, the British government hired a good friend of mine from New Zealand, who was a very good trade diplomat, who had worked at the WTO, who had worked at the OECD, and who was in retirement in New Zealand, and he was hired by the UK in order to teach them how to negotiate. So these are just a few examples and uh, I agree completely what is understood now by many citizens in other 
Euro European countries, member countries, what is actually due to the European Union? Because normally citizens don't know. That's not bad in itself, but sometimes it's the reason why people ask, why do we need the EU? And this is due to the, to, to the way the European Union works. One has to understand that. In, what is done in Brussels is to take decisions about what you want to do to go in that certain direction. But then the fine tuning and the translation of, of, of uh, decisions taken in Brussels is done in national parliaments. So the laws are passed in national parliaments, but they are based to a very large extent on what has been agreed amongst 27 member states. So the citizen sees a German law, an Austrian law, a Spanish law, and is not necessarily aware that this law is based on a collective agreement and each and every member state has the possibility to integrate measures how it fits into a national system, because the national system of Spain is different from the one in Finland. But the goal is the same. And also, if the European Union is spending money, and we are spending quite a lot of money on, on, on our budget, there is nobody who hands out the money directly to any citizen. The money of the European Union is given to the member states, and the member states are using the money for a specific purpose. And you all know a little bit about politics. You will not find many politicians who would say, oh, this is money I got from Brussels, and with that money I am building this airport. They will always say, I am the good guy. I am giving the money. I am building. And there we even had to take this rather funny measure that if infrastructure as part of regional policy is financed by the European Union, then member states have to put up a sign financed by the European Union. And in order to make sure that it is not written in minuscule letters, one even had to pass a regulation how big the letters are just to get the message across. And you can also see it by the sheer fact for the European, the European Union has about 40,000 40, officials. So you cannot directly manage Europe with 40,000 officials. And about 20,000 of these officials are working with languages because we have 24 official languages, which means you have to translate, interpret all the time. Was well, so, so much for, 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 for that. And just one, one more thing I, 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 I noted. Um, yeah, the, the norm setting. I think this is, this is perhaps an, an element of foreign policy which is not really known because it's not regarded to be foreign policy, but it's very much foreign policy of the European Union to try to set international standards. If in the automotive sector, European standards are the dominant standards, then it's easier for the European automotive industry to export worldwide. If you can make sure that the rules and regulations on international stock exchanges, stock markets, are based on the European model, then it is easier to bring your company to the New York Stock Exchange instead of going through a lot of motions. We have set an international standard now for data protection, GDPR. Korea was very eager to join in order to make sure that there can be data, uh, the exchange of data between the European Union and Korea. We have negotiated that. Korea has uh, to, had to set up an independent authority, which is making sure that the data, the privacy is protected. That's thanks to the joining of the, of, of, of um, uh, the, the, the European model. And I think on the 4th of August, in a few days, the Korean 
uh, law will be valid. And from that point onwards, then we can take the decision to recognize equivalency. What we have done also a few days ago is we have published taxonomy. This is uh, rules and regulations which define which investment is green investment. Because we are talking a lot, a, a lot about green deal, greening of the economy. But what does that mean? When is a financial instrument green? It's not the paint. You need an agreement on that. And we are trying to promote that now as a worldwide standard because it's a very effective element to direct investment. To give you just one example, if all the pension funds in the world, and they hold most of the money for future pensions, if they only invest in companies which are certified as green companies according to international standards, and they don't invest in others, that will create a very strong incentive for companies to get certified as green. Thank you, Ambassador. <clears throat> President Kim. Yes, more than 90% of the, you're talking about the standards, uh, I agree. But I would like to talk about the, uh, the uh, European standard versus international standard. We, we, are, we are talking about this, the so many issues about the standard uh, when we are negotiating Korea EU FTA. And then the European, uh, uh, partners, counterpart, always uh, European officials, yeah? Maybe one of the, uh, the two, uh, 20,000 people, yeah, except the, uh, the translators. And then uh, they, they were talking that, the, oh, European standard is uh, international standard now because there are so many 20, at the time 27 countries, including the United Kingdom, is just uh, 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 using the, this kind of standard and the other countries also. But Korean standard is something different from the, uh, the European standard. Uh, so you need to uh, adjust yourself, accommodate yourself to the uh, European standard because European standard is an international standard. <clears throat> so uh, Europe has been initiating the, the so many standards, not only the, uh, like the, uh, the, um, the environmental standard or green uh, issues, but also uh, other, issue, other standards like the uh, uh, safety belt in automobiles, and then a strength of the steel, uh, steel planet in the automobile, something like that. So very, uh, very many, uh, many, many uh, uh, standards. I mean, the Europe, uh, Europe has been created, and the, the European Union was the, uh, uh, the locomotive of the to create this kind of a European level and standard. So. Uh, we Koreans have some kind of uh, ambivalence, I mean, the feelings about the European standard because uh, uh, in one sense, I mean, uh, because there's so many European countries and other neighboring countries are following uh, this standard, uh, uh, it's better for us to uh, just to follow. But in other cases, I mean, we have our own standard. In that case, I mean, to accommodate our stand, to change our uh, standard to the European standard uh, was not easy. So in that case, uh, the, the best solution is a kind of the mutual standard, mutual recognition. So both uh, parties can uh, just, I mean, uh, keep their own standard and then, or, and then they can uh, just recognize, I mean, other, uh, other, uh, other parts of the standard. So this is uh, uh, one, uh, one thing. And then another point is about, I mean, Michael was talking about uh, uh, suddenly the, the Moon Jae-in government, uh, I mean, you know, uh, pronounced the, uh, the Green New Deal. And then uh, I just want to talk about uh, these issues because uh, 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 intergovernmental uh, talk, talks uh, under the uh, Korean government, uh, when, when I have a chance to uh, participate, I always argue that uh, we need to fasten the, our, the process in the, for the green, green, green uh, initiatives. And always, I, mean, I was talking about the, the, what the, the EU is now doing on the, in this green, green things, green deal or other things. The one thing is that, um, you know, the one thing I, uh, I admire, uh, in a sense, I mean, the, the European initiative is that, um, I mean, green, green initiative is simply good. Uh, this is uh, uh, the best strategy for the, uh, the sustainable development and growth. 
And then the other thing is that um, uh, what I what I was thinking that is that uh, Europe is developing the uh, the green standard, green standards. So uh, as I talk as I talked before, uh, after the uh, the, the Europe uh, developed the all kind of the green standards, uh, maybe the Korea or maybe in in the future uh, have to follow the just I mean, green green standard uh, created by Europe. Uh, that is costly to Koreans. So we need to develop the, our own standard, uh, and then uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the, the difference different from the, the European standard. But anyway, we need to think about the, the how to uh, develop our own uh, standards uh, related to the green industry, uh, green uh, you know green initiatives, and that kind of things. So uh, that's another background why the Moon Jae-in government is now uh, pushing uh, to the uh, green New Deal. Uh, green New Deal is now the one of the pillar, two pill, one of the two pillar is digital New Deal and the Green New Deal, and based by the uh, uh, the human security and human development, uh, which is called Human New Deal. So, uh, but anyway, I would like to emphasize that the um, green uh, thing is uh, uh, one of the uh, the main uh, initiatives that uh, that by the initiated by uh, this current government, but. Um, uh, maybe my next following following government also uh, will uh, keep the, the the pursuing I mean this kind of the goal and the initiatives as well. Yeah. Michael, you have some. Yeah, but that's 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 very good news, and I I, I hope it will it it, it will tra transpire because I think also the message which I'm trying to give is based on our experience, uh, greening the economy is good for business. Um, it's the old concept that uh, green greening is against the economy. If you invest, if you develop technology, and you have to to, to develop new new products, uh, then then th then you can be part of the of of the leaders uh, basically. And therefore, we also invite uh, Korea to work with us also on green standards. Standards need not be costly. It's only costly if you have different standards for no good reason. Very often, different standards or slightly different standards are simply protectionist. i give you an example. When you are on the highway, then you have a bus lane. And look on the bus lane. You will only see Korean buses. Have you ever thought, why are there no foreign buses in Korea? Whereas passenger cars, you have European cars, uh, Japanese cars, whatever, but only Korean buses. Well, the secret is standard. You have a standard which says that the difference between the ground and the bottom of the bus is perhaps that, that much. 12 centimeters different in Korea than in the rest of the world. That doesn't change the quality, that doesn't change the security, it's simply different. And what's the thinking? The thinking is that the big bus producers of the world, whether they are Europeans or American or whatever, they will not produce a bus only for Korea because the market is too small. So therefore, there's no competition. It's only Korean buses because of 12 centimeters. It's just different. That's protectionist. Therefore, standards, and you have mentioned it, they, should, they need not be the same. They should be equivalent, equivalency. That's the, that's the word, and, and then you can come to a mutual recognition. But equivalency of 12 centimeter difference, no. We would not grant equivalency because it doesn't serve any purpose except being different. So that's a concrete example in trade policy which has real impact on, on, on real uh, uh, life. Um, when it comes to, to green policy, um, 
one of the challenges each and every government has is to work with the industrial and economic circles, especially in times of crisis. And we are in times of crisis. COVID is running havoc with the economy. Prediction in Europe is minus 7.5% on average, which means some countries will have minus 10%, others will have minus 3%, which will create tensions. Uh, but if you spend money now, and everybody spends money, in the European Union, we are trying to put together um, um, a package of 3.4 trillion euros. I have no idea how much money that is. If you translate it into one, you, and, and I can't even pronounce it, whatever that is, uh, trillion, billion, what the hell. What, what the hell. Um, but now the important element, and therefore we are trying to adapt the European Green Deal, which was developed before the Corona crisis, before. It's not an effect of the, of the crisis, it was before. Now we have to make sure that all the money which will be spent is spent wisely. There is no point in saving industries now with a lot of money which are not competitive or which are part of the black economy and not of the green economy. That's of course a difficult task because all the companies in which have a problem ask Give me money to survive. And politicians have to take the decision and say, well, I'm not giving you money to survive. I'm giving you money to survive if you do the following, to push them into these green directions. And the larger the company, the more people are, may lose their job, the more they will push and say, just give me money and don't put any conditions to it. I will not give you a concrete example that was, has, has already happened in Korea, as it has happened in Europe. So it's difficult, but we have, we have to do it, because it's, it's also a political and a generational issue. If we, from the elder generation, give to you, to the younger generation, a huge amount of debt, because all these programs, governments are devising now are debt. And somebody has to pay for that debt. And that's you. You will pay this debt probably until 2050. So it's you. And if we give you on top of a huge amount of debt, a planet which is sending alarm signs all the time already, then we are not going, we are, we are not a good generation. It's a failure. So in order to find a solution, we at least have to make sure that the investment is done in a way that you get a better econ economy, a better industry, which if it is functioning, will help you to pay back the debt. And that's a political and a generational issue. And if we don't solve that in societies, we will have a problem. And if we don't solve it in international politics, we will have another problem. Because one of the elements of the, of the crisis in international politics is that the difference between rich countries and poor countries becomes bigger. Like in a society, if the prosperity gap is growing, and that's an issue which we have to face and which we can only face in international politics if we stay with an open system, an open trading system, an open political system, a system which is based on multilateralism, on cooperation, and not on isolation, on zero-sum games, and if somebody tells you, I'm the, I'm the greatest, I'm the biggest, I'm the most beautiful, whatever, first of all, don't believe it. And secondly, the message you are getting is, if I am the best, I'm automatically telling you, you are not the best. Thank you.
Um, I have forgotten to mention that uh, the event is uh, uh, planned to be only one hour. Uh, however, after our panelist discussion, uh, we will open the floor for you to have some opportunities to ask questions, right? So some 15 to 20 minutes, uh, we will have a question and answer session after all this uh, round table discussion. Um, I mean, uh, the two gentlemen, two panelists were having some slightly different views about the international standards, the values, and so on. Uh, probably these uh, issues can be uh, discussed uh, once again in a in another venue. Uh, so let's come back to our um, original agenda. Uh, original agenda included the Korea EU relations, and I wanted to ask you also about uh, the uh, thing like uh, how the European Union responded to uh, the uh, diverse uh, crisis. However, because of the shortage of time, let's come uh, to the Korea-EU uh, relations. Uh, um, Ambassador, you have uh, written quite recently a, a small briefing uh, article about the 10th anniversary of uh, uh, Korea-EU strategic partnership. So what was or what were the main messages you wanted to send uh, through this article? Well, the, as I said in the introductory remarks briefly, it is some a strategic partnership for the European Union is something special. We are not using this label uh, lightheartedly because otherwise we would have more than 10 strategic partnerships. There are other countries who are rather generous in the, in the use and then they have to say, well, it's not only strategic, it's super strategic or whatever. So we, we don't do that. Um, we had on the 30th of June, so just a few, few, few days ago, a um, virtual summit meeting between President Moon Jae-in and the two presidents of the European um, Union, European Commission and European Union. And that was a very good occasion, first of all, to recognize the fact that we have the 10th anniversary and um, also to recognize the, the little symbol, uh, the logo which we, we, which we have um, uh, developed uh, to, to make it more visible. Um, that uh, we will have to work together in taking up global, global challenges. They are on the one hand linked to the COVID crisis. In the work, working together in a strategic partnership has, has a dual effect. It is the bilateral element where we have agreed that we will, we, we will, um, spe we will uh, open up and work together when it comes to research, uh, vaccine development, uh, um, and, and everything which is health related. And by the way, uh, we also agreed that if a vaccine is developed, then it should be for the common mankind. That's also very important because otherwise you go back what I have mentioned, you see, you see the prosperity gap. Who can afford to buy a vaccine? which is costly to develop. So irrespective of intellectual property rights, that should be for everybody once it is, we have it, and then it has to be produced in large quantities. So that was agreed very, very um, uh, quickly. And then we also said, well, we have to think about uh, uh, the poorest country because of this uh, gap. And there, Korea as the fourth largest economy in, in Asia and eighth largest in the world, you share responsibility. But luckily that was not an issue that was, that was agreed that we work together there. We have, we, we have called this, this program Team Europe. And so please join Team, Team, Team Europe. And that was agreed uh, also in, in in development aid and in strengthening uh, the resilience and the, the of 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 the poorest uh, countries, um, we have also discussed that that we have to strengthen the international uh, rules based system because it is under duress. We are we were all used to what is called the liberal international order, which has served us well. Us 
meaning all of us, also China, because China, of course, is a major factor of insecurity right now. But China has grown up in the liberal international order, has developed as it has, has joined because we pushed the World Trade Organization in 2002. We had high hopes. I was still making trade policy at that time and we also we had hoped this will be a big game changer. It was not a game changer, but I think it kept China more in line as it would have been without, uh, be, uh, without being part of it. But we said, okay, we have to work on the World Trade Organization. We have, to, we have to make sure that it comes back to life. And Korea is showing now much more interest in the World Trade Organization ever since uh, the trade minister is running as a candidate to become a director general of, of the WTO, which is a good sign. I think there should be engagement. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have also discussed that we have to uh, strengthen um, cooperation in all the challenges which normally are called fourth industrial revolution. So when it comes to, to artificial intelligence, the internet of things, um, uh, big data, all these, these uh, areas are part of, of, of the digital economy. And the green economy and the digital the common economy, these are the two main factors which both of us, and there was agreement, we will stress in the, in, in, in the further development. So there was agreement on, 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 on these issues. And then we also touched, it was a one hour meeting, uh, uh, briefly on some of the foreign policy issues, which included, of course, uh, North Korea, which included elements of rule of law, like uh, the situation in, in, in the Ukraine, the situation in, in, in Iran, um, um, and the situation in, in, in Afghanistan. So that was mentioned also. And I think the, the, the important conclusion was, okay, we have ticked now all the boxes, and when we have, hopefully, in the second half of this year, a real summit and not a virtual summit, then we can go deeper in all the issues which we have touched upon. So there is, I think, a clear program where we can work. The message I always give to Korea, and I will also give it here, there's a tendency in Korea to take the European Union for granted because we are not the troublemaker. We, we, we are a little bit outside. We, we don't have troops. We don't have an army. Uh, we are, I think, good partners when it comes to, to trade. We are good partners when, when we come to investment. By the way, we are the largest investors in Korea. It's not the United States. It's not China. It's not Japan. It's the European Union. Um, but we are not troublemakers. And if you're, not, if you're not making troubles, you are taking for granted. So once in a while, you just have to, have to remind people, it's like a plant. If you don't water the plant, it dies. So that's a little bit the message which we have to, to give. Thank you. Uh, President Kim, you have been working for a long time on asia Europe relations and Korea-EU cooperation. So... What is your uh, observation? Uh, first of all, I, I, I would like to just uh, mention that um, uh, Europe and EU is not a um, troublemaker, but um, I think that Europe is also a troublemaker. Yeah? Uh, when the, uh, the Greek crisis and, and, yeah, and COVID, uh, many Koreans are um, looking at the, uh, the, what uh, this kind of situation is uh, developing. And then, uh, any uh, and Brexit as well, and the, the increasing I mean uh, uncertainties from Europe uh, may influence the the Korea and the Korean economy as well. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, I agree with the uh, the ambassador that um, uh, and uh, because of the the Europe uh, was a good friend and then always uh, was a good uh, uh, neighbor, so. Uh, sometimes, in many cases, uh, we just uh, forget the how, uh, how, how, how much, uh, how good 
the uh, the the Eurobees for the Korea. So we need to uh, uh, keep interest in the Europe and the Europe uh, what's going on in Europe as well. And the f f first of all, I'd like to emphasize that um, uh, the relations between the two uh, changed a lot uh, after uh, since the uh, the, the uh, Korea's diplomatic relations uh, with the European uh, at the time communities, uh, economic communities in 1963. So at the time, the, uh, think of the, what, what happens in 1963, just time like Korea was one of the uh, poorest countries in the world, and the Europe is the, uh, the, the most advanced economies in the world, and also not only the economic areas, but also other issues and political and the value and the cultural and many other things, uh, Europe is the, uh, uh, one of the, the advanced uh, regions in the world. And after the uh, you know, 60, 60 years uh, of the after following the establishment of the uh, developing uh, diplomatic relations, uh, things was quite uh, changed a lot because uh, at the time the, when uh, the both parties had uh, these uh, diplomatic ties, uh, then the relations between the two is something like uh, uh, non-reciprocal non uh, preferential uh, treatment provided by uh, the EU and then European countries uh, to Korea at the time. And now, uh, more, more or less, the, the one of the reciprocities and co prosperities something like convergence uh, in such fields like the, uh, the institutions and the culture uh, uh, regulations and standard, uh, as well as the uh, the income level, right? So I think that the both parties now have more broader uh, issues to talk now, and then actually, as the ambassador emphasized, uh, strategic partnership uh, under the flagship of the strategic partnership, Korea and the EU uh, have uh, more and more uh, things to talk. Not only the bilateral issues, but also. Uh, global issues as well. So that is very important to change uh, for uh, for actual Korea, because the uh, the European countries uh, has a global uh, views uh, in 1960s, 70s as well. And but the Korea was very uh, narrow-minded country at the time, just time is surviving. Yeah. And then now. Uh, Korea and Korean people, Korean government uh, uh, recognized that, fully recognizing uh, the, uh, the, not only the bilateral and or regional issues, but also uh, global issues are also uh, very important uh, for the co-prosperity co co of, of Korean people and then our neighboring countries uh, and then uh, other countries as well. So all of this kind of uh, uh, very splendid development between the two uh, I have uh, I have observed that this kind of change, uh, big changes, uh, just to 22 decades. But uh, even just uh, looking at the two decades, a lot of you know dramatic changes uh, I could uh, observe. And then uh, I am thrilled uh, uh, to anticipate that what kind of things we uh, we we can see the in the next two decades uh, between the two. And then uh, I hope and I believe that. Um, the two parties, I mean, you know, dialogue and the mutual understanding uh, would be much more strengthened uh, uh, in the future. Uh, not only the other, uh, just, I mean, uh, the economic ties, but also uh, other issues, including political, cultural, and the value, and um, uh, security issues as well. Thank you. We have uh, reached uh, nearly uh, the end of uh, the session. Uh, we have uh, probably two or three minutes. Um, President Kim and uh, Ambassador, do you have any last words? You have uh, uh, not uh, have uh, had the opportunity to talk for one or two minutes. Uh, as Korea is now developing more and then then Europe is getting more important now uh, in many ways. So uh, I think that um, uh, I'm quite optimistic uh, in the, uh, the future relations between uh, Korea and the EU uh, based on the, uh, this kind of belief. 
uh, then uh, I hope the uh, the uh, more and more and students I mean have a more you know, interest in the uh, the European studies as well. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. Yes, I mean the I think the the, the geopolitical situation is 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 changing. Uh, Korea is in the geographically where it is. China, Japan, United States, tensions amongst uh, all kinds of, of actors, need to diversify and reaching out to like-minded partners. And I think that would, it's a good argument to further increase the cooperation between Korea and the, and the European Union and to develop the strategic partnership further. What is necessary, and there I would like to pay tribute to the Jean Monnet uh, centers which we have in, 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 in Korea. You, and you meaning many Koreans and also the foreign students who are here, you have to know and understand to a certain degree at least the European Union what it stands for, what you can achieve, and what you cannot achieve. We are not the solution to all the problems. On the contrary, we create problems, but we are also trying to solve, solve problems. So uh, I would never say, look and implement the European Union that makes you happy. That might make you very unhappy, but the principles, the, air, the, the necessity of cooperation, of integration, which is totally lacking in Northeast Asia, and uh, the lack of institutions. I think this is something which should be food for thought, and it's a task of universities to provide you for food, with food for thought. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador. Uh, you are leaving at the end of August, but uh, why don't you stay longer? Because uh, you have seen many questions directed to you. You have to answer these questions. Uh, but uh, this is not possible at this time, at this moment. Um, Ambassador would come back to Korea uh, in any possible occasions. Uh, President Kim, I, and also other colleagues in Korea would invite him to conferences or to other uh, events like this, it will be not easy to find this combination of uh, President Kim and uh, Mikhail Leiter uh, discussing with me uh, on the future of the European Union and Korea EU relations. However, we will have uh, we will prepare other occasions uh, where the EU experts, uh, President Kim or others, uh, would come to our campus and have a uh, discussion with you. Um, I really very highly appreciate your attendance today because it is really very uh, difficult time now, but you made the way to attend this uh, event and thank you very much for that. Thank you and uh, uh, stay safe. Just my last word uh, in going out, take one of the blue bags. Might be not completely useless what is inside. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.